Thomas Jefferson wrote, the acquisition of Canada will be a mere matter of marching. American Secretary of War John C. Calhoun said, in four weeks, the whole of Canada will be in our possession. Not quite. Here now to tell us how Upper Canada, against the odds, fended off the American attack, Janice Phillips. She's the author of the historical novel, The Silent Canoe, and we welcome you back for part two of our conversation. Great, Steve. When we last met, you were telling us about how in the uh, late 18th century, European settlers uh, came from, I guess, the United States mostly, came up here, found absolutely nothing uh, beyond the indigenous people who lived here in, in the forest and started to create what is today present-day Toronto. I want to stay in that time, late 18th century. John Graves Simcoe is the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, Upper Canada, as it was then called. We celebrate him today by Simcoe Day in August, our civic holiday. The actual War of 1812 is still 20 years away, but Simcoe wants to go to war against the Americans now. How come? Well, he, he was actually a commander in the American Revolution, and um, he was very bitter that the British lost. He was a monarchist to the hilt. He, he definitely did not approve of the idea of democracy or the republic. And he wanted to just quash those ideas because these were new emerging ideas that were coming out. He wanted to get rid of them, nip it in the bud, so to speak. So he basically just wanted to ensure that that would not spread anywhere further. So instead of waiting for them to come together and attack Canada, he wanted to go in and attack them. He wanted to go in, take over, and get rid of the idea of democracy altogether and have the, the monarch rule. Now, when you say get rid of democracy, you don't mean a legislature. You just mean president, Congress, that kind of thing. Well, president, Congress, but also the idea of democracy is voting. And that is because they never actually practice true democracy in America. Because true democracy is when everybody is voting. It's more like a referendum. That's what true democracy is. And yet we have representational democracy. Mm -hmm. that, that's how they determine to actually represent themselves. So in the legislature, you mean? In the legislature. Mm -hmm. um, there was never a chance where everybody voted on an issue. You only have representatives do it for you. And um, he definitely just did not want to have that idea come up. He wanted to quash it. He, too populist, eh? Too, he definitely was. He, he just wanted to get rid of it altogether. So he wanted to, I presume he went to the king or sent a message to the king saying, you know, I know we went through this, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago, but can we go to war against the United States now again? He definitely did. He was in, um, mostly in contact with the governor general and then the secretary of war, which was Henry Dundas. And he, he would pose these ideas to them. What did they say to him? They just said no. <laughs> okay, we, been there, done that. Been there, done yeah. there. We don't want to go to war. They were worried about the French. They saw what was happening in France, and they were more worried about that than what was happening over the, in the Americas. So Simcoe was, of course, the big cheese here in Upper Canada at this time. And then suddenly, one day, he just up and left. What happened? Well, basically, it's, it's hard to say. I would say that he was very disgruntled with not being listened to. He wanted to go in and attack the Americans and get rid of that altogether. And he, he was not able to. He was not able to be as forceful or put the agenda together that he wanted. Um, and I think he was completely frustrated. He hmm. wanted to leave. At the same time, you read that he, while he was in Upper Canada, he was quite ill most of the time. And we believe that that probably was malaria that he had. And when he did leave, it was uh, basically, it was a sick leave, as you could say. And when he did return to England, he, he did in fact um, heal and he, he was much better uh, in health. Did he not go to Haiti at some point though and fight in the war down there? He did. After he returned to England, he went, he went down to Haiti and at this time he was still the Governor General of Upper Canada <laughs> and this was two or three years after he had already left. And so they just had somebody that was in his place in the interim waiting for the Governor General to come back. And he never did. And he didn't. In fact, he died in 1806. Yes. So the poor guy never actually got to participate in the war against America, which would take place just six years after his death. Exactly. And he knew the war was coming. He definitely knew it. And 
I'm sure he wanted to be the lead participant in that war, and but uh, you know, fate, fate intervened and fate intervened, and that was it for him. Yeah. But we do remember him today. We yes. have Simcoe Day today. We do. So that's a beautiful thing. I want to uh, again have you take us into the time, into this city, which I guess was still called York at this time, uh, end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century. And there's a, there's a moment in your book where there is a dispute. And the local court of the day has decided that the best resolution to this dispute is to publicly flog the person that they believed was guilty of a crime. Did that really happen? Well, I can say yes and no. There was a crime that the main character did not sure exactly what the crime was, but it was severe. And it had something to do with the Humber River. And I just know that from research. I read that in a book. The Devons did something to do with the Humber River. Isaac Devons is your is the main real character. life character who you've written this historical fiction around. Exactly. So I went to the archives to try to find the record of the trial, which I did find. And what I found was that he was more severely punished than anybody for a year before him or after. So he did something very severe. And you don't know what it is? I don't know what it is, but I know it had something to do with the Humber River. And uh, basically, he was, he was sentenced, most of the crimes except for his, they were basically given a fine that they had to pay of 10 or 15 pounds. His was double that, so it said 30 pounds plus and then there was an ink splotch. So I never got to see exactly what it was, but he, he had to pay and he had to do something else. Now at that time, they didn't, jail time did not exist. People didn't go to jail for a crime at all. Jails were there to hold prisoners before a trial and that's it. So the punishments that you got were corporal punishment. And the ones that, that were there at the time in Upper Canada were flogging, being put in the pillory, and also banishment, so being banished from the town or the country, whatever it might be. So at that point, Upper Canada, or sorry, in Toronto, actually, there was no pillory. They couldn't afford one, so they just didn't have it. So that left banishment, which didn't happen. So my inference was that it had to be flogging. And they flogged him in public? Yes. In front of everybody? Yes. Now, I haven't read accounts of his flogging, but I have read accounts of other floggings that happened at that time in Toronto. And it was definitely something that was done. Yikes. OK, let's get you a little more forward now. We're cozying up to the year 1812, and the war is coming. And I wonder what impact this looming war with the United States had on how our infrastructure basically came together in what was then York and would become Toronto, on how the roads were built, the towns were built, all of that. Well, it had a huge impact, Steve, and it was because Governor Simcoe, who was the first person there, the grand master planner of the province, he basically wanted to defend the province against an attack by America. So basically, all of our province was built to defense against that attack. And what we see today and what we know and where the towns are is all because of trying to defend against that attack. Like what? Well, for instance, the first thing Governor Simcoe did was he built the Dundas Road. And he built it from Burlington up to the River Thames, which is near London. And because he wanted to have an overland escape route, because all, most of what happened in wars at that time was battles at sea. But he realized that he needed an overland escape route in case, in case Lake Ontario was completely taken over by the Americans. He needed to be able to move to another lake. So, so the Dundas Street, where the Eaton Centre is today, which if you go further west turns into Highway 5, that all has its roots 200 years ago. 200 years ago, exactly. So they extended it from Burlington West, and then they extended it east, as you said, up here to, to Young Street, and then it continued on to Kingston. It was, and that's where it stretched to up until the War of 1812. It was at Kingston all the way through to the London area. <laughs> as well, Young Street was, committed, was uh, built as a military road as well, and because he needed an overland escape route north. If you took Young Street, you could get up to 
Lake Simcoe, and from there, through a portage, he could get to Lake Huron. So he built, he had Young Street built all the way from Lake Ontario to Lake Simcoe? Well, he, he tried a oh. few times. Okay. It went through a few... Um, fits and starts. Fits and starts, definitely. And, but eventually it did extend up to at least um, Richmond Hill by the time that hmm. he had left. And I guess yeah. that would have been a pretty good job in the day, right? If you got hired by the governor to help build this road? Well, yes and no. Um, I mean, really, it, uh, it was somewhat well-paying. I mean, you, you were paid probably a year's salary for doing that work. Hmm. Um, but it was horrible conditions that they had to go through. I mean, it was full of mosquitoes. It was wet and dirty. And, you know, any food that you would have would be what you happen to hunt or trap. And it, it just was not good conditions. And it went all the way through the winter as well. Well, Have you seen Young Street in downtown Toronto today on a hot summer day? Yes. It's still the same, you know, mosquitoes <laughs> and miserable conditions. Anyway, never mind. It's still like that. Well, you, got, you said in the book, quote, fortifying the province against attack drove every decision Governor Simcoe made and established the foundation of planning for the province. It definitely did. So it was not only the roads that he built, but it was also then where did he build the forts? He built one in Toronto. He well, built Fort York is the biggie. Fort York. Yeah. He built in Niagara, he built in the Windsor area, and again in the Kingston area. And as after the war, those areas of settlement became basically areas of concentration. So that meant that instead of just going elsewhere, people tended to go where these forts were, and those are where our cities started to develop and evolve from, is where these forts were situated. So are you saying that had Simcoe not feared American invasion from the looming war, the city would have developed completely differently? It very well could have. There was no real advantage to locating here in Toronto at all. Hmm. And, um, but except for the fact that at that time, Governor Simcoe thought that Toronto offered the perfect defense, and that was because of the harbor. And the harbor offered, uh, if you put a fort at the mouth, which he did, it offered the chance to have the town inside, in the crux of the harbor, to be protected. So that's why he located in Toronto. But it, it doesn't mean that he, um, that he didn't want it to happen elsewhere. Mm. The War of 1812, pits a half a million Canadians, although we weren't technically Canadians yet, British, British North Americans, I guess, against seven million Americans. This sounds like a mismatch. How did the upper Canadians of the day like their chances with those odds? Well, you know, Steve, they were completely fearful, and many of them just did not think they had any hope or any chance. Understandably. It completely was understandable because of the size of the population and the armies. And even though the British army was behind them, they were busy with their war with Napoleon over in Europe. And there was no help at all from, from the British army at all at the beginning. And it's incredible because the, um, the degree of apathy was so strong that even uh, General uh, Isaac Brock, four years before the war came out in 1807, he's quoted as saying that, that if, if Canada and America did go to war, what, why, why the Americans would be successful is because of the Canadian lack of spirit. Hmm. And the Canadians were so sure that they would be beaten that they would just basically give up. And there was so much apathy there. He had no lack of spirit, that's for sure. He did not. And that was one of the principal things that he did uh, once he was given the go-ahead to start defending the province against um, an invasion, was to basically just start through propaganda measures, try to get people to think differently, to believe that they could win. That's what his principal thing that he can be remembered for is how he changed the whole psyche from one of there's no way we can possibly win to yes, we can. You've been to Queenston Heights. You've seen the memorial yes, to Isaac Brock. Definitely. What do you think of it? Well, it's pretty grand. I think it's pretty grand and it's, uh, you know, it's very high up on the mountain as well. And um, yeah, I was there actually just last year for the festival that they had the reenactment at Queenston Heights, and there was 15,000 people there, and it was just really an incredible ceremony that they had. 
attended by um, both uh, Canadians and Americans. The 200th anniversary of his death was last year. Yes. He died, obviously, fighting that battle at Queenston yes. Heights. And did you get to Ottawa, to the uh, museum, to see the War of 1812 exhibition? I have been there, yes. Did you see his uniform? Yes. Isn't it, I don't know what your uh, reaction was to it, but I must say, having been to Queenston Heights and seen all that, and you know, you and I are both history nerds, I found it a very emotional experience seeing the actual uniform of the guy with the bullet hole where, you know, which resulted right. in his death. Yes. And the uniform is there in that museum to see. Yes. What did you think when you saw it? Well, it's quite moving, yeah. I think, because it just brings, makes it seem so real, especially seeing that bullet hole. And it's not real. I shouldn't have called it a bullet hole, a musket ball hole. A musket ball yeah. hole, which is even bigger. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, it's quite interesting about his death because there's a few different accounts of what actually happened. And just you know, the specifics about how he did die. Um, one is that he, he just died and, you know, and that hit and he just perished. And he just perished. Mm -hmm. There's another account, and this is the one that I put in the silent canoe, is that um, he was hit, he was lying there, you know, about to, about to die, and a young soldier came up to him and said to him, are you hurt very much, sir? to which um, there was no answer, and then he died. And so that's the account that I, I chose to put in the book. Which is true, though? Well, we, we will never know. We will never Where'd know. Where'd you find your account, though? Well, it was in and amongst a bunch of different um, sources, online sources and books that I had read. And it's really, you know, there is no recording they didn't record things the way we do today. No TV so. cameras on the battlefield in those days? <laughs> exactly, no hmm. TV cameras. I like your version better. <laughs> I hope it happened that way. Yes, it's just, me too. It's, it's grander. Um, many of the upper Canadian settlers of the time, of course, were former Americans who had moved up here for whatever, better opportunity, loyalty to the king, etc., etc. And I wonder how they, what did they do during the War of 1812? Whose side were they on? Well, you know, there was a lot of cross-border uh, connections or immigration, I guess you could say, right before the war. There's a lot of people in Canada that were <laughs> sure that the Americans were going to win, so they, they went south because they knew from the last war that if you were caught on the wrong side, you, after the war, it was a very bad situation because, as we know, the Loyalists, after the war in America, they were completely perished. They had their homes taken away, everything was burned, and they just were given a miserable, miserable deal. But, um, so they wanted to make sure that they were on the right side. But on the other hand, there was a number of Americans that just looked around them and didn't think that the Americans could possibly get themselves together enough to defeat the British. And so they, they came north. So there's a lot of people that crossed both sides. And at that point, too, there was families that extended on both sides, too. And so they didn't really want to have family go against family, so sometimes they joined together on one side or the other. It was a civil war in many respects, wasn't it? In many respects, it was. Let's talk about uh, the Battle of Fort York, which uh, stands today at the uh, waterfront of Toronto. Uh, the Americans captured our fort, but what a Pyrrhic victory. Tell the story of what happened at Fort York. Well, at Fort York, it was one of the bloodiest battles of the whole war. And um, the reason for that was because of the explosion that they did. And what was happening was that the Americans came in. They needed to win. This was the first battle for the Americans that they had actually won. Up until that, they had been defeated. And Actually, it was, there was a fear within the government of the United States that if they didn't win something soon, then there was going to be a revolt. People would say, don't do this anymore. We just, you know, we're embarrassing ourselves. All we're doing is we're, we declared war and we lose, we lose, we lose. So they needed to do an easy victory. So they chose York because most of the army was in Montreal and Quebec City. Because most of the British Army. Most of the British Army was there because they figured that they needed to control anything coming in from Europe. They need, needed to be able to control the waterways. So 
there was not a lot of troops stationed in York. So when the Americans came, they came with at least 10 times the number of soldiers, and they completely decimated York. There, there was basically nothing was left. And um, what they did, though, was that um, they came in, and the uh, General Shafe at the time, he happened to be in Toronto at the time. It wasn't his station, but he happened to be there. He knew they were going to lose, so he said, OK, everybody retreat. We're going to blow up. We're not going to give them our gunpowder. So we're going to blow it up. So they caused a grand explosion. And in doing so, they killed about 250 Americans with that explosion. So it was important for the Americans because it actually gave them a victory. And um, for the Canadians, I guess it was important just because they decimated the army in a little way. A six-hour assault, more than 300 dead, one of the bloodiest battles of the war. Yes, definitely. Hmm. When the Americans um, finished, uh, what was left of Fort York? I know what it looks like today. You know, obviously it's been rebuilt and it's a tourist attraction and uh, people can go there and learn about the history of it, but it was a conflagration when they left, was it not? Yes, and actually the fort that we see today is um, in a different location than the fort that they fought in the war. It was across the other side of Garrison Creek. Um, but when they rebuilt it, they rebuilt it in the, in the location that we know now. And um, but back, the one that was destroyed, uh, basically it was a wooden fort. So it was fairly easy to, to destroy the palisades and destroy the buildings. And um, they just basically burned it to the ground. Hmm. Now, how was it that at the end of the day, despite being outnumbered, despite the advantages the Americans had, et cetera, et cetera, how was it this war ended in a tie? Well, it's, it depends who you ask if it, war, if it what ended in a tie, um, because... Well, what do you think? I, I always thought that history said this status, status quo antebellum, right? Things are as they were before the war started. Yes. So nobody kept any new territory, and Detroit is not in Ontario today because of that, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And, um, well, you have to look at the motivations of why war was declared. And um, for the Americans, I mean, they... they had issues with the idea of impressment, and they had I issues with the idea of the trade embargo that was forced on them. But they also wanted to expand north and west. So it definitely was in their war plan that they wanted to come and take over. So even though they got the British to relax on the impressment and the trade, they didn't do what they wanted to do, which was come in and actually expand north. They sure expanded west. They did expand and, west. And, and destroyed numerous uh, Native American lives in the process in doing so. Yes, definitely. And that's another book to be written. Indeed. <laughs> so we didn't end up getting American-style democracy because of that War of 1812, because we didn't lose it. We may not have won it, but we didn't lose it. But we did get the family compact. Was that better? Well, you know what? I really can't say that it was, to tell you the truth. And it's something that I just read an interesting article just yesterday, actually, that about the, fam about the fact that the Americans right now have a family compact. <laughs> and just being that almost everybody who's been a president for the last 30 or 40 years is somehow related to, to each other in some way. And I think it was President Obama was actually related to um, another another of the other presidents. I, I'll have to read that again. I think it's Bush. It could be Bush. I Did you so. read the same article? I read the same article, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What was I think that McGinty and Hudak are, are cousins, and I think Bush and um, Obama are cousins somewhere way back down the line. But the family compact essentially was the elites owned and ran everything exactly. and didn't care about the egalitarianism or, or giving uh, the average guy a shot back then. And that's, I mean, there's a lot of that in the United States today. Yes. And for Canada, too, I mean, um, again, the Family Compact was born when, uh, when Upper Canada was born in 1793. Mm -hmm. Governor Simcoe wanted to make sure that there was an aristocracy. He, didn't, he wanted to make sure that there was a group of trusted people that, that could actually govern things. He didn't want the idea of anybody could just 
walk up and, and govern and be president. He okay. did not want so that. So he wasn't right about everything then. Exactly. Tell me this just finally in our last minute, Janice. You and I are fascinated by this time in our history, and I read your book and I enjoyed your book very much. Why should anybody else care about this? This is 200 years ago. Well, it was 200 years ago, but this will never happen again. We will never have this kind of wilderness and we will never have that situation where we have a blank slate and how do you go about doing it and why are you doing it and why are you creating different different elements and I just think it's very important to understand where you're from and to understand where you are right now and where you're going in your future and it's you know when you walk down Young Street you can imagine it as a military road or as I ride my bike along the trail um, and I can look out over Lake Ontario I can imagine canoes and I can imagine the battles that were happening back then and to just really have this reference to where you live is just so rich if you want a good summer read, you could do a lot worse than The Silent Canoe by Janice Phillip, who's been our guest for the last couple of days. Thanks a lot, Janice. Enjoyed it. Thanks, Steve. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.